Today we're going to be learning two about Daf Tzadi Dalit. It's the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to start at the Gemara at the very bottom of Tzadi Gimel Amabet. We're just going to review quickly the Mishnah. The Mishnah had talked about a case where there's a man married to four women, and each one wants to demand their ketuba. So it goes in the order of when they married, first, then second, then third, then fourth, assuming there's enough money, and each one has to swear to the next one if they so demand. The second one says to the first, before you take your field, because maybe the second one wants the field that the first one took, before you take a promise that you didn't get any money during his lifetime, and then she can take it after she swears. The third one can make the second one swear, the fourth one can make the third one swear, the fourth one doesn't need to swear because to who is she going to swear? However, Ben Nana says, what are you talking about? We're going we're gonna to give her a reward because she was last, and she, <coughs> excuse me, and she won't have to swear? That's crazy. She also needs to swear, to which the Gemara is going to try to figure out. What's the machloka between Tanakama and Ben Nanas? We're going to have three different interpretations. Amar Shmuel. Shmuel says, And both Shmuel and the next interpretation are both going to say that the case is where one of the fields was stolen. Rashi says it was known that it was stolen. However, some of the commentaries say, as you'll, you'll see in a minute why they say, it doesn't really make sense. Maybe it's out of concern that one of them might be stolen. But if it was really known one of them was stolen, then this wouldn't be necessary. So we'll see right now why. What's the debate if one of the fields was stolen? Let's say number three collected a field that was stolen. Or let's say we go by the interpretation, any one of them potentially could have stolen, taken a field that was potentially stolen. So what's the issue? Well, the issue is, which we saw already on Daf Tzadi. Right? We have, I owe money to two different people. One of them I owe in January, the other I owe in February. The one for February comes and demands the money first. The machloket is the machloket for that issue, which is, Tanakama sabar masha gava lo gava. If the one who's, oh, I owe money in February comes and takes the money, let's say in December, and then the one in January comes and tries to get their money and I have no money left, they can basically go to the one who took, who was from February, who took the money too early and say, hey, you weren't supposed to take the money. And what you got is not yours and give it back to me. That's Tanakama. Now, what's the, okay, let's go on for just one minute and then we'll go back. And Ben Nanas holds like the one who says, Masha Gava Gava. No, he took the money. He was owed the money. He took the money. It's true he came early and took it early, but he got what he got and it's his now. And the other person can't demand it from them. The January bar uh, lender can't come and get the money back from the February one. Now, what does this have to do with our case? Well, if Numbers one, two, and three collect their field. Number four goes to collect her field, and she gets from the last field. Turns out number three was stolen. When the, ro- the person who was robbed comes to take his field back from woman number three, woman number three wants to go to number four and say, hey, give me the field back. So if we hold Masha Gava Lo Gava, that what number four took really wasn't hers to take because in the end, three's field was stolen. Really, number three has first dibs at the field of the husband's. That field goes to number three. Number four ends up with nothing. Well, then when number four goes to claim her field, assuming right, it's still there because the, the robber hasn't, the one who was robbed hasn't taken back his field. So number four doesn't need to swear because even if all goes wrong and number three's field gets taken away from her at some point in the future, she'll just take number four's field without a problem because number four in the end, retroactively, really never got their field because that field was never hers to get. But it, and that's Tanakama. So Masha Gava, Lo Gava, what number four got was really not number four's to take. So therefore, number three will come and take it, and therefore there's no point to take a swear, to, for number four to swear before she collects it. However, if you hold, like Ben Nanas, that Mash, and that's, we'll say that Ben Nanas holds Masha Gava Gava, what number four took, she took it. Okay, number three happened to be on a stolen field, and that's why some people say it can't be. It was definitely stolen because it was definitely stolen. Number three would never let number four take the field. Number three would say, "Let me take that field, and I'll leave you with the stolen one." Because again, she has first dibs. So therefore, that's why the commentaries say it must be. We're not sure at this point whether it was stolen or not. When they find out it's stolen, it's going to be too late. Number four got it fair and square, and there's nothing she can do. So therefore, what are we going to say? Therefore. She's going to make number four swear before she takes that field 
just in case something goes wrong down the road and it ends up getting taken away, she wants to make sure she's really deserving of that field. Maybe she got some of her money in her life and maybe she's not deserving of the field at all. And then the field will be left for number three to take if in the event or any of them to take if in the event the field that they took ended up being stolen. That's option number one to what the machloket is. Sounds a little convoluted, but that's the machloket. Rav Nachman Amar Rabba Baravua Dekule Amar Masha Gavalo Gavan. There's no real machloket about it, or even if there is, they don't disagree. Ben Nanas and Tanakama, that's not what they're debating. They all agree that what number four took was not really hers to take. So then, why do you need to swear? Hacha Bacheshinon Shema Tachzif Kamifli. The question is, are we worried that number four will destroy the field? Maybe she'll miss she'll misuse it. Maybe she'll want to get a short-term gain because maybe she's worried they'll take the field away from her at some point. Um, so again, let me just go back. Clearly, we're talking about the concern that one of these is a stolen field. And then since one, two, or three might end up having to end up with the field that number four took, because Masha Gavalogava won't be theirs in the end if the field is stolen, that, right? it won't be number four's, they'll be able to collect it from her. Well, are we worried maybe she'll destroy the field? Now, if we're worried maybe she'll destroy the field, what are we going to do? We're going to make her swear that she didn't get any money in her lifetime because... Okay, so now, again, there's a debate among the commentaries exactly what she's swearing about. But this made the most sense to me, this commentary that I read, which is she's going to make her swear because she'd rather she not have the field at all. Because if she has the field, she might ruin it. So therefore, let's try to make her swear to ensure that she really deserves the field because she doesn't really deserve the field and she ruins it, that'll really be a shame. So therefore, let's make her swear that she definitely didn't get any tube money and is deserving of all of it. And that's the machloket. So mar sevar cheshin and shem tachsif. If we're worried she's going to ruin it, that's why Ben Nanas makes her swear. Umar sevar, the other opinion says, lo cheshin and shem tachsif. We're not worried. Shem tachsif. And therefore, there's no issue here because in the end, we're not worried she's going to ruin the field. And therefore, Number three, number two, number one, has no claim on number four at all. Because again, if the field ends up stolen, they'll get it back without a problem, so they don't need to make her swear. That's option number two. So both first and second answers of what the machloket is, both explain it in a case where the field, one of the fields was stolen, or at least maybe there's a concern that one of the fields was stolen, and that's part of the issue. And then again, it depends what the issue is. Is it that it's considered collected or it's not considered collected, or is it are we worried? Maybe she'll ruin it, or we're not worried. Abaye brings a whole different explanation, and this goes back to something we've learned many times, which is when they would collect the money from the orphans. Remember, who are they collecting it from? The guy died. They're collecting it from the children. Do they need to swear? Right? We learned already. In order to collect from the orphans, you have to swear. So that's the swear that they're talking about. The first swearing was each to each other. But the fourth one, and this actually really matches the language of Benanas, who says, "What are we going to reward this woman?" Reward her from what? To exempt her from the swear to the orphans. Everybody has to, anyone who collects from orphans has to swear. Right? Why do they have to swear? So one of two reasons, and this is going to be the machloket. Is it because they're young and we don't want to take advantage of young orphans and we're protecting the young orphans who aren't smart enough to kind of fend for themselves? Or is it really, and this is usually we discuss it, that since they're not the father. The father had the loan out, or in this case, he owed the ketubah money and maybe paid them the ketubah money during their lifetime. And if it was a loan, you know, maybe he paid back the loan already. And the father's not here to say, I already paid it back and try to get into an argument with them and see who wins. But since he's not here to make a claim, basically the orphans don't know. They have no idea what the father did. They weren't involved in the nitty gritty of, you know, all the dad's business when he was alive. So they have no idea. So therefore, you can't, you have to swear if you want to collect money from them that you didn't get the money paid back to you yet. So therefore, the machloket is all about this. Now, let's see. So what's the machloket? It sounds pretty clear. You'd have to swear to the orphans. So why would Tanakama say you don't? So Abai Amal, the Abai Kashishi Ikabinayim. The statement that Abai the elder, which is not the same Abai made, that's the machloket between them. Ditane Abba Kashisha, Abba the elder, brought a bright that says, Yitomim Sha'amru, the Yitomim that we say, you have to swear to the Yatomim to get anything, any money back from the estate. Right? If you claim your own money, whether it's the woman getting her tube or anybody, it's older people, right? Older children even, and of course younger children. In other words, it applies across the ages. It doesn't matter how old the orphans are. If it's dealing with their father's property, you could be 50 years old, your father passes away. That's You have to deal with your father's uh, estate. And 
You might not know whether your father paid people back or not, and anyone who comes to you, you would have to basically say, swear if you want to get it, that you didn't get the money back yet. Tanakama, late lay out of the Abakashisha. So Tanakama doesn't hold by this. Tanakama thinks it's only Ketani. It's just that we're worried about people taking advantage of minors, 50-year-olds, know how to make their own decisions. Benanas, Ile la Abakashisha, right? It's not about people abusing them. It's about that they had no way to know whether they're 50 or whether they're 30 or whether they're 10, right? They had no way to know what their father's uh, property was doing. So there's third interpretation, which has nothing to do with stolen land and the women at all. It just has to do with anybody demanding money from orphans, right? You'd have to say that the other opinions just think that this is devoid of that, right? This is talking about swearing to each other about it. And that, again, you'd have to say maybe they just think that we're talking about orphans who are older and they don't agree with Habakashish. Maybe that's what now we're talking about something different that eventually will connect. Two brothers or two partners who share property. Okay, so the partners share or the brothers share. And they go to court against a person. Okay, they have an issue with someone, someone demanding property from them or whatever it is. And one of them goes to court to argue the case. The other one can't come later and say, you, you argued your case for your half, but me, I'm going to go argue my own case. Uh, you can't say that. Okay, so if you're my sister and you went to court to plead our case, and I come and say, you know, like let's say you lose the money, and I say, look, you lost your half of it, but I'm going to go to court and argue my half, you can't say that. My sister worked as my messenger. She worked, on, she went to court on both of our behalves. So she was basically my messenger. I can't go claim, oh, I could have made a better case and I'm going to go make my case in court for my half. That's what Rav Huna said. Ikla Rav Nachman the Sura, Rav Nachman the Gata Sura, and Shailinu, Kiai Gavnamai, they asked him the same thing. What would you say in a case like this? Amar lehu, matnitin. This can be learned from the Mishnah. Let's go back to the second part of the Mishnah. After the first part that we already dealt with, the Mishnah says, Hayu kulan yotzot b'yom achad. If all of them had, a, they all got married on the same day. If you have the earlier contract, you get it. And that's what they would write in Jerusalem. They would put in the hours of, the, of that, and therefore even one hour before it, you would win. But if it was all the same hour, they would have to divide it equally. So now, oh, total mistake on my part. It's not this part of the mission yet. We're getting there soon. Sorry. That's a good intro to the next section. I was trying to think in my head what's the connection, and I just got confused, and then I said, oh, that's not it. It's in the beginning part of the Mishnah. What did it say in the beginning part of the Mishnah? It's not for naught that I did this, because we will need that intro for the next section. Um, so if you're married to four women, what did we say? The first one swears to the second one. The second one swears to the third. The third one swears to the fourth. So... Now we say the following. Now, it doesn't say the first one has to swear to the third one. Theoretically, the third one could also say, it's very nice to the second one, you made her swear to you, but I need to see it myself. She has to swear to me. And we don't see that. They each only swear once. So this seems to be comparable, although in a minute we're going to say this is totally not comparable. To which the Gemara rejects his proof and says, so in the end, just to point out, Rav Huna and Rav Nachman say the same thing, which is the second brother can't come along and say, I don't, you know, you didn't plead my case, because of course he acted as his messenger. To which, just like here, the second one demanded a shvua from the uh, swearing from the first one, and that holds also for number three and number four as well. To which the Gemara says, Midami, those are not similar. Hatam shvua lechad shvua lamea. It wasn't like there was a court case and somebody pleaded their case and they did a poor job and, and the woman wants to come and say, you know, I want to do a better job. But here, she made her swear. In the end, woman number one, wife number one, swore. A swear is good for one person, it's good for a hundred people. It, if the third one made her swear, she'd say the exact same thing. The shvua that she made should apply to any of them, should be relevant to any of the sisters. It's a woman swearing. It doesn't matter. It's not like an argument in court. I could have argued the case better. So therefore, that's when once she swears to one, it's like swearing to a hundred. 
Hacha Amar, but here he could say, Ilu Ana Havai, if I were there, Ta'anina Tfei, I could have made a better claim. So even though the Gemara doesn't say you could do this, it seems to be indicating that there's some debate about it. Okay, what they're really saying is there's no proof from the Mishnah to this law. But theoretically, they're raising the possibility that maybe you could make a claim. I could have argued my case better. But the Gemara says, even if you're going to say this, that you could claim a claim like that, only under certain circumstances. It's only if he's not in the city. If he wasn't in the city at the time of the court case. You should have come to court. You can't come after the fact and say, oh, I didn't mean for you to be my lawyer. I should have argued it myself. If you were in the city and you totally could have come, why didn't you come and show up to court? Only if you couldn't have been there because you were out of town that day somewhere else and you couldn't have made it there, then we give you the opportunity or at least possibility that maybe we would, but certainly not if you weren't if you were already in the city and didn't show up. Seems very fair. Okay, now go back and redo my intro. Okay, so my intro to this M part of the Mishnah, which is again, if there's hours in the, the document, which they would do in Jerusalem, then it goes by hour. Otherwise, we go by day. So if you have the same day, then, right, then, then, if you all have the same document from the same day, you'd all have to split it equally. Okay, even if one was given before the other. So Itmar, now we have a machlok at Rav and Shmuel. Shnei shtarot hayosim biyom achad. If you have two shtarot that were, had the same date on them. Rav amar chokim, Shmuel amar shudididayne. What's the case? The case is, I sold my land to one of you. You each have a star that says, I sold you my land. Okay, the commentaries talk about that. We're talking about a star Kenyan, not a star Raya. These are two different types of documents. Shtar Raya means, I sold you land with money. And then I gave you a star to just prove that this had happened. That's not what we're talking about. That's just a proof to the deal. But if the star was the document with which you purchased the land, now you purchased the land by signing a document that created the purchase, okay, or by us having witnesses, we wrote up a document, we signed our names, or we, we have witnesses sign on it. That, right, we don't really have to sign our names on it, we just have to have witnesses on it. Right? Nowadays, we sign our names. Those days, witnesses would sign on it, and then I would give you the star, and that giving it to you, affect, right, the writing of it and the giving to you, we're going to talk exactly about this, the signing and the giving, those are two major acts of it, that, and the question is which one is the more important, that basically creates the kinyan, the acquiring. So now I did this with two people, which is super confusing why I would do that, I don't really know, but I did it with two people on the same day. So now they both come and bring a star that says, here's my star, it's signed on witnesses that Michelle sold us the land. So, Rav says, Chokim, we split a 50-50. Shmuel says, Shu de didaini. We let the judges decide which one of us should get it. This is a bit of an ethical or a moral question, which is, are we better off having each one get half when we know that one of them is getting something they really don't deserve because only one of them really owns the land? Or are we better off trying to, not having somebody who will like, ruling the case where we know it's not a truthful judgment, right? It might be fair, but it's not truthful because someone is definitely getting half of a, right? They're only getting half. One of them has half that they don't own, right? They're, they have land that they don't own and the other one is getting, is losing out. So we better off risking it and maybe one will get nothing of what he owes and the other will have a hundred percent of something that someone else is with the hope that the judges will choose the right person and then it will be 100%, everything will be perfect or not, right? That's the question. So, and the question is, how does Shuda Dedaine work? Is it that we have the judges come in and do a real assessment of who they think was really the one who I meant to sell it to based on all sorts of research they could do, what they knew of our relationship, I, you know, whatever it might be. Obviously, I'm not here to tell you what I really meant. And, or is it just that Judges have power to basically move property from one to the other. And based on laws of Hefker, Baked in Hefker, they can take money from you and say that really belongs to someone else. And therefore, they have the rights to do this and they're going to choose which one. A little bit more arbitrarily, okay? So there's different ways of understanding how this should die and it works in terms of what the mechanism they use and is it that they're trying to figure out the actual truth or they're just trying to create a new truth. So in any case, Lema, that's more for an Iun Shir, where you could go more in depth to really properly understand this concept. Lema Rav Amar Karabi Meir. Ta'amal Ede Chatim So now we want to figure out what's the Machloka Rav and Shmuel. So the first suggestion is, they debate this classic Machloka that appears all throughout Masechet Gitin, which is, 
Is it the ones who sign the get that make the get that are the critical ones, or is it the giving of the get? And the ones, the witnesses who watched him give her the get. Okay, so Rabbi Meir says it's the witnesses on the document. So therefore, let's look at the situation. You have a document and you have a document. They both say you bought it for me and it's both dated the same day. So you both have equal rights to it because the main thing is the signature, okay? And the, and the document. You both have a totally valid document. Shmuel, who says we're going to go with only one of you, is because Damar Rabbi Elazar. Damar Edi Mesira Karte. Rabbi Elazar says, writing the document doesn't mean anything. It could be I wrote both documents and I was planning to decide later which I was going to give it to you. And I gave it to one of you and then I gave it to the second one. But... Once I gave it to the first one, I didn't own the land anymore. So since it's the Masira that makes it all happen, once I handed it to you, then when I gave another document to your friend, that was a totally invalid action. It meant zero. So your friend has zero rights to it, and you have all the rights to it. The question is, we just don't know who's you and who's the friend, which one got the first one. And that's why we do a shoot the Dedaine. But really, only one of you has any legitimate claim. We just don't know which one has the legitimate claim. To which the Gemara says, look, that's not the Machloket, although in a minute we're going to come back to this and say that was the Machloket, but we're going to try a second attempt. Everybody holds like Rabbi Elazar. Now, what did I tell you? Well, it's true that only one of you got the land. We still don't know which one of you. So the question is, it's true only one of you owns the land, but the question is, how do we decide? Are we better off deciding by the mechanism of Yachloku? Chalukah better just split 50-50 because we don't know who's right. And Shmuel Savar Shuda de Daina Adifa. And Shmuel says, no, better to go with the judges assessing which who they think is more right. So, now the Gemara says that all sounds fine and well, but you can't possibly say that Rav holds like Rabbi Elazar in this kind of a case. Why? We have this whole statement that Rav Yehuda said. In the name of Rav, and then in the name of Shmuel, and then it will be clear what Rav holds about this. Rav Yudas in the name of Rav, Halachat ke Rabbi Elazar begiti. We pass him like Rabbi Elazar when it comes to get. When it comes to get, it's the handing over of the get to the woman that's important. And the witnesses that watch that. Viki amarita came de Shmuel. But when I told Shmuel what Rav, Yehuda, what Rav said, Amar af bishtalot. He said, even in other documents, not just get, other documents as well. From here, what can you infer about Rav? If only Shmuel said, yes, it's true for other documents as well, and Rav said, only by get. From there, you can assume that Rav held that when it came to regular documents, we don't say that. And therefore, it must be he doesn't hold like Rabbi Elazar when it comes to documents like this. Because our documents are regular documents, they're not divorce documents. So going back to square one, Rav must hold like Rabbi Meir, Shmuel must hold like Rabbi Elazar. Now the Gemara is going to bring a contradiction against Shmuel from a bright, and we're going to have two different explanations. Sounds like exactly our case. You have two documents saying the same thing, right? Same date. We split it 50-50. That goes perfectly against Shmuel. So, first answer. Ah, that's easy. That's Rabbi Meir. Yeah, it's true, this bright against me, but we already know it's a machloka tanaim, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Elaza, who holds what? This one holds like Rabbi Meir, that matches Rav, because Rav holds like Rabbi Meir, I hold like Rabbi Elaza. The problem is that the continuation of that bright doesn't work for that theory. E Rabbi Meir, Ema Seifa, Katav Echad Masar Lachel. If you wrote to one, then gave to another one, it's wrote a star for the second person, gave it to the second one, and then gave the first star to the first one, Zesha Masar Lokana. Who wins out here? The one who got the document first. Well, that can't be Rabbi Meir, because I Rabbi Meir, am I kana? Ha'amar e'dechatim akarte. Right, he would say, you both have a document with the same date. It would be whoever, right, or whoever had the document with the earlier date, and not whoever got it first. So, can't say that. So therefore, how do we understand this b'raita? So Shmuel will say, ah, the b'raita is within Rabbi Elazar, because you can't explain the b'raita Rabbi Meir because of the continuation. But tonight, it's a machloket tanaim. It's a machloket tanaim whether, again, this goes back to what we said before, whether in a case of, right, the brighter that says, even though we hold Edi Mesira and only one of them is right, the question is, how do you decide who's going to get it? Because in the end, we don't know who is first. So, yachloku versus letting the judges decide. 
And then the Brighta is still within Rabbi Elazar, but yet disagrees with Shmuel. Now, how does he know it's a Tanaitic debate? And then he can basically say, I don't hold by that Tana. Well, in a different case, and I'll tell you the case before we read it inside, because we're not going to read the case inside, they're just going to tell us the law. It's a case in Gitin Dafyu Dalit. It talks about if I send you to bring a gift to somebody, and I say, go give this guy a hundred, hundred zoos. Now, when I said helech, did I mean zeche, and you acquire it for him, so that means it's already his by the time I give it to you, or does it not mean zeche? And what I meant is when you give it to him, then it becomes his. So in the, what's the difference? Well, here, let's say I gave it to you, and you get there and the person's dead. Now, if I were here, and then you come back to me and you say, hey, you know, they died. But let's say you go to them and they died. And then you come back to me to find out what did I want you to do with it. Right? Did I mean Zeche, acquire this for him and therefore his your shim get it? Or did I mean give it to him, but if he's not there, come bring it back to me? And, and now what happened in this case is I was dead by the time you, get, you got back. So now we have a situation that you brought this money. Now you bring it back and you don't know who it goes to because you don't know, did I... Was it acquired already by the dead person when I gave it to you? In which case, his your shame get it? Or, right, he might have even been alive at the time, but it doesn't matter. I acquired it on his behalf. Or did I want it to go back to the original owner? So in that case, <laughs> But here they say, So you see different approaches. Do we do the or do we say, no, we should give it to whoever, whoever the, the messenger, right? I, the messenger, I gave it to you. You get to decide who really, right, what did I mean? You get to figure that out, which is just like the shoe did the dying. Okay, same idea. Okay, next. Ima de Rami Barhamu. We're going to have a case. I want to give you some background. Rav Sheshit and Rav Nachman, we've seen them before. We've seen them a bunch of times arguing. Sheshit worked for the Resh Galuta. He often had some thugs that worked with him as well. Okay, we're gonna, there was a famous case in Eruvin where Rav Shesha puts up a lechi in the different way that they wanted in the in the courtyard of I think it was near in the Mavoy, maybe even where the Resh Galuta was, and the guys, the Resh Galuta's thugs took it all down and then they said, But Rav Shesha told us to do this, you know, and then he felt a little badly. But there's often Rav Shesha and Rav Nachman were often at odds with each other, and Rav Nachman had higher status because he worked he was the Rev of the Resh Galuta and he was married to the daughter of the Resh Galuta, so he had a lot of stature there. So the mother of Rami Barhama, Katvinu Lenichse Le Rami Barhama Batsafra, she wrote her her property to her to Rami Barhama in the morning, Le Orta that evening, Katvinu Le Marukva Barhama. Then she writes it to her other son. So now each one has a star with the same day. It says, The land is to me. Ata Rami Barhama the Kameda Rav Sheshet. So Rami Barhama, the first one, comes up to Ram to Rav Sheshet and Ukme Binichse. He said, Ah, oh, it's yours. You got it first. Atam Rukva the Kameda Rav Nachman Ukme Binuchsam. Her Ukva says, you know, probably he said, let me go to Rav Sheshit's arch enemy and see maybe he'll rule in my favor. So again, I don't know they were exactly arch enemies, but they definitely argued a lot. So in fact, he was right. He did well. He chose well. Rav Nachman said, it's yours. Atam Rav Sheshit the Kameda Rav Nachman. Rav Sheshit pounds into you know barges into Rav Nachman's office and says to him. Amrle, my time Avi Barachi, why on earth did you do that? I already ruled for the first son. Now you're ruling for the other son? Making things very complicated. Amrle, Sheshit says to him, my time Avi Barachi, why did you do what you did? Amrle, the Kadim, Rav Sheshit says, Rami Barachama was first. Amrle, says to him, back to our Mishnah. What are you living in Jerusalem? That they write ours? They don't write hours. They both have the same date on it. It makes no difference who got it first. Ella mar ma'ita mar ma'ita ma'avid hachi. So he says. So why did you rule? He says to Rab Nachman. Why did you rule with the second son? Yeah, maybe they both have you know the same date. But why would you then give him all the money? Amalei shu did the dayne. I did an assessment. I thought the mother gave it to him, right? For whatever reason, maybe he thought the mother left him more. Maybe he said if he gave it to her second, maybe there's more logic that. He, she really meant him. She was undoing the first. Amalei, to which Rav Sheshit goes back to him. Ah, oh, Ananami Shu did the Dayanai. I also assessed that the mother must have assumed she was giving it to Rami Barham. She gave it to him first. Must be she wanted him to get it. Now, what's the problem with Rav Sheshit? He didn't start with Shu did the Dayana. He only said that after, right? He tried to say he was first. Then once that didn't work, he changes his tone. 
So Rav Nachman doesn't like that. So Amrle, Rav Nachman says back to him, I got two issues with what you just said. Chada da'ina umar lav da'ina. Firstly, I'm a judge and you're not a judge. He really puts him down. Right? He says, you might be a Tami Chacham, you sit in the Beit Midrash, but you don't have a court. I have a court. I work for the Reish Galuta. I'm in a position of prominence. You're not. Ve'od me'ikara la b'torad hachi atit le la. You didn't come to this in the beginning with Shudid Dainé. You want to shoot me this Shudid Dainé, just like I said, that you disagree with me. But it's not like that was your claim from the beginning. You switched claims in the middle because your first one didn't work. That already, you lose a lot of credibility. Okay, last story for today. Hanu Treshtari, the Atu the Kamejo of Yosef. Two documents were brought in front of him for the same land. Chad of Akatu Bechamsha Benisam. One said the fifth of Nisam. Bechad of Akatu Be Benisam Stama. One just said Nisan, and Nisan could mean the first of Nisan, it could mean the 29th of Nisan, it could mean any other date in between. So what do you do? He said the one who has the fifth has more rights to it. The other one said, What, you're going to make me lose? I don't understand. Maybe I'm the first of Nisan. You have the lower hand. Why? You, could, you don't have any proof. And furthermore, it could be that you're really only on the 29th, 29th of Nisan, and therefore he has an earlier date than you do. This conversation is going to continue, and we're going to see the continuation of this in tomorrow's shir. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom, and with this we will end today's class. Shavuot Tov.